Are you a field of dreams marketer? Someone who thinks if I build it, they will come? I was for a long time. Sometimes it feels like I still am. That's why I was excited to talk to Julian Garsdine. He blends psychology and business in a way I haven't seen before to help business owners stand out and sell more. As creators, we can learn a ton from addressing the six basic needs in our own content and products. Listen for these top takeaways. One, businesses aren't just transactions. They are run by people for people. The sooner you realize that, the sooner you'll connect with your potential customers. Number two, establish your identity. Being too general means you're not connecting with anyone. Doing a deep dive into your identity and the persona of your customers makes them relate to you more. And number three, the key to negotiations is, you guessed it, understanding the needs of the person on the other side of the table. Do that and you'll be able to quantify your value in something other than numbers. This was a great interview. I know you'll enjoy it. If you want to hear Julian and I talk about how to establish your authority by giving everything away for free, sign up for How I Built It Pro and the membership over at casabona.org slash join. You can find all of the show notes and everything we talked about over at howibuilt.it slash 320. But for now, let's get to the intro and then the interview. Hey, everybody, and welcome to How I Built It, the podcast where you get free coaching calls from successful creators. Each week, you get actionable advice on how you can build a better content business to increase revenue and establish yourself as an authority. I'm your host, Joe Casabona. Now let's get to it. All right. I am here with Julian Garsdine, the CEO of Invictus Modus. And I'm really excited because we're going to be talking about uh, psychology principles. And this is really, uh, I wish I knew more about this. Um, Let's just bring Julian in now. Julian, how are you? I'm doing well, Joe. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, When this uh, topic came across my desk, I got pretty excited because this is not something in... um, 350 episodes between the numbered and not numbered episodes. Not something I've really talked about on the show. Um, I was like a hard science major, you know, software engineering. And so we always viewed the soft sciences as not real science. And now that I need to like market and convince people that I'm worth hiring, I really regret that. (laughs) So (laughs) uh, I'm very excited to have you on the show. And I just want to dive right into it. Um, Where is the overlap between psych and business, psychology and business? Yeah, you know, you you hit it right on the head, um, especially for individuals who've, who've majored in essentially hard sciences. We look at business these days as so transactional. You know, there is a product or service and there's a dollar value attached to it. And you know, the uh, revenue is essentially the scoreboard and everybody's looking at it so mechanical, uh, whether it's from an operational standpoint um, or just a simple sales standpoint. Uh, but what we really hone in on and, and see at the core of it, um, really beyond the surface, is uh, business doesn't exist uh, without the human element, right? Hu- uh, business is an extension um, of uh, humans, so to speak. So you have on one end an individual that's identified a potential need in the market um, or has a passion for a particular product or service and wants to make an impact. And on the other end, uh, a prospect or a candidate that might benefit from it, right? And so the product of the ser- and the service is just essentially the modality to connect two parties um, or more together and uh, through the means we call business. The transaction really is 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 a part of it, but it's, it's really not the whole thing. And if we look at... Uh, what goes on in that process, um, most of it is based on uh, psychological influences, um, particularly honing in on adding value. Uh, you know, we hear about these value-based approaches, human-centric approaches to business, um, solving problems. Um, and these problems, what do they typically uh, generate? They generate pain points for companies who are made up of individuals um, or uh, opportunities um, that, that need to be further uh, capitalized on or exploited. So realistically, at the core of business, 
uh, lies psychology, um, given that business is a, is a derivative of, of human psychology. Business wouldn't exist uh, without it, so to speak. Yeah, I love that. And it makes perfect sense, right? I mean, as we record this, we're less than a week from, uh, not to put this in time, I guess, but I do it all the time, so it doesn't matter. Um, We're less than a week from WWDC, right? And one of the questions uh, or one of the things I constantly hear about Apple and how they position their products is what's the story? What's the story behind this, right? With the Apple Watch, it became about um, life-saving um health metrics right you you they in the last uh in the last WWDC keynote they had letters from people saying like your watch literally saved my life right um so now they're getting ready to release this VR thing and and again all the apple pundits are asking what's the story what's the connection how are how are they going to make us feel about this device so um, it's not necessarily just about you know services or or uh, um, you know actual emotional stuff, but it, about technology products too, right? We we want to feel a certain way about our phone, our watch, our microphone because that's what makes us buy. That's what moves us. Absolutely, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. When you talk about a, a particularly consumer products, what are you really buying? You know, most times we're we're buying an identity. Um, something that resonates with us, something that resonates with our story, that resonates, you know, potentially with our pain points, with the opportunities that we want to uh, take advantage of potentially. And so it is spot on. People tend to connect with people um, more than they do with, with with products. You can have a fantastic product if it doesn't appeal to the masses, uh, if it doesn't touch on those particular points that that, that make that are meaningful or impactful to them, um, and that could be a go nowhere. And and we see the pro- oftentimes we see a lot of products in the market that you're wondering how did this even make it, you know? And th- they really understood, um, you know, h- how to resonate with their audience particularly. And so it's certainly uh, people connecting with people and and, and the impact that uh, these things could have. Yeah, that's exactly right. I love that. Um, I always took a very like field of dreams approach, right? Like if I build it, they will come. Um, I've I've built this thing. I know it's good because I know I'm good at stuff. And so you should get it. Um, But that doesn't make anybody feel anything, right? How many times did I just say I there, right? I should be saying you. Hey, I built, you are spending too much. I'm a podcast coach, right? So uh, you are spending too much time on your podcast. Wouldn't you like to spend more time with your kids, right? If if you hire me, I will guide you through the process of spending less time on your podcast so you can spend more time with your kids. Spot on, spot on. I have a saying that resonated with me um, a long time ago. It says, don't fall in love with the product or service, uh, fall in love with your audience. And if you do fall in love with your audience, you'll really know how to... Uh, put forth, you know, your best foot to, 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 to best serve them. And when, and when people on the other end um, see that and, and feel that, it makes the transaction um, that much more smooth, that much more pure. Yeah, I th- that's such a great point to, to move to, right? Because I think, especially in the creator economy, right, where we're trying to build audiences, ideally, I mean, to I'm trying to make a living, right? So I want to build my audience so that, I find enough people to buy my product or service so that I can support my family. Um, th- that is, a v- again, a very me-centric approach, but we want to be able to connect with our audience. And when, when you get in front of the microphone or the camera or whatever for TikTok, I guess it's the camera for TikTok too, um, you, you really do want to forge that connection. You don't just want to... Um, I'll give an example. I was following a person on LinkedIn for a while and their videos, their short form videos, I honestly, if you had told me that it was like one of those AI generated videos with a synthesized voice, I would have believed it. Like just very cold, emotionless, regurgitating facts. I felt, I felt bad. I felt worse after watching those videos. So um, when we think about, I, I mean, like in our, in our pre-show, we were talking about like the six basic needs and some of these psychology principles. How can we use those to create better content and connect with our audience? How do we fall in love with our audience and make them fall in love with us? 
absolutely. I think it's uh, really about, uh, I, I, we can talk about, you know, maybe six or seven fundamentals. Um, I think that would be beneficial to any audience, you know, those who are uh, architecting a startup um, versus those who are already in the, in the midst of it and, and scaling, whether it's a small business, um, you know, a solo um, artist or entrepreneur. Big fundamentals is if I, I think it's really important at first you, you you establish an identity right and and part of that identity is you 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 don't want to be a jack of all trades right um, you don't want to be speaking to generalities um, especially uh, you know in in your domain right you like to take deep dives for for a reason there's there's a lot of substance um, underneath the surface that that, that people want to explore and they can go anywhere for for vague or, or general information so. In any business, you, you certainly want to establish an identity, understand, hey, what problem am I trying to solve? You know, that's, that's a, it's, a, it's a very different approach than most people would take is, hey, I'm already coming up with a, a vision or a position and I'm imposing it on the market for whatever reason um, that, that may be driving them. Uh, but I really think that the beginning of it is identifying what is the problem I want to solve? What is the impact that I want to make, right? And from there, you know, that will lie... Uh, it will tie very closely to what your passions are, perhaps. Um, what is a compelling vision for you? What, what, what stance do you want to take? What, what do you want to bring forth to the market um, of value? Uh, and from that, taking the human-centric approach in all of this is saying, well, who's going to be impacted the most by this? Or who do I want to impact the most? You move over to understanding your audience. What audience do I want to appeal to? And from there, you know, using principles of psychology, of course, because we're talking about now, you know, a human uh, centric approach and connecting with people is how do I impact these people in the greatest manner, um, you know, or, or the most quickly. Um, and, and you start looking at, well, what are fundamentals of human behavior? What are humans really looking for at their core? And I learned this a, a long ago from a seminar um, at Tony Robbins that I watched, and he's, he's famous for putting these things um, into perspective. And he said, well, there, there are fundamentally two major drivers. There are six basic needs that, that humans usually undergo. Um, and there are two of them that, you know, typically um, fall the strongest for the masses. Now, we have all, every individual has all of these six needs. Uh, however, you know, usually your two most pronounced really shape your identity or how you act on a day-to-day -day basis. And unfortunately, in the world that we live in, and in the reality is, um, is the need for significance um, and the need for certainty, which means, you know, and, and not to say that these are, are, are negative things, but these are usually the most pronounced in business, um, per se, is, you know, everybody wants to feel like they're somebody, you know, uh, they have a contribution to society, they're able to do uh, something meaningful, they can establish a legacy um, and, 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 and make an impact. And the need for certainty is everybody loves some sense of structure, knowing what's coming next. They have a sense of direction. You know, when things are stable, we tend to be the most uh, comfortable. Um, but then in retrospect, you know, when things are stable, we also tend to be the most complacent. And so we have to be careful for these things. Um, now, we look at the third need here, which is the need for variety uh, or the need for uncertainty. Um, you know, as, as Tony Robbins puts it, it's a variety is the spice to life, right? We like to have different things on different days, you know, knowing what you're going to eat day in and day out per se, or what you're going to do. And, and it's the same task. It kind of can grow a little bit mundane, but uh, we only like the surprises um, that we enjoy, right? Um, we, we, we don't like surprises that may throw a uh, dent into our lives or, or, or cause us some sort of pain. Um, outside of that, it's, it's the need for growth. Um, people want to feel like they're growing and there's a constant evolution. You know, growth is progress. Progress is motivation. When we, we don't necessarily have to perfect something um, out the gate, but we want to know that we're making meaningful strides towards it. It keeps us in the race, um, so to speak, so that when we can see that. Um, and love and connection. You know, we all want to feel that we're a part of something. We want to feel, uh, you know, love with deep, meaningful relationships and connections. That can be either in the workplace with other people um, uh, and so on, just a sense of culture, a sense of community. And then uh, last one I would uh, touch base on here is, is contribution. Um, you know, how do you give back? What is the impact that you want to make? Uh, you know, what is something that we, we hold near and dear to us, we may be good at, that we think we can teach the world and, and contribute to somebody else, pass the torch, have them take it to uh, a different level, um, so to speak, but leave, leave our impact on the world um, 
with something that 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 we've our skill or or something that we've been able to acquire over the course of our careers or the course of our experiences um, as 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 humans. And so those are essentially the six basic needs, and and those can be architected into a business by really you know implementing them when you understand your audience. Who is it that I'm trying to serve? What are the certain needs that may be driving these folks' behavior? And how can I help bridge the gap between my product and service and the fulfillment of, of those needs? Um, so touching base on the first you know, two large principles, I would say, for any entrepreneur um, or anybody that's really trying to uh, make it in the world of business is understanding your identity, taking the human-centric approach by understanding your audience. And your audience may be your employees, it may be your viewers, it may be your um, stock uh, holders, your shareholders, wh- whoever it might be. Um, you know, and in this case, um, for, for, for the folks that you serve um, on your podcast, it's going to be the acquiring the audience, uh, you know, uh, more so. And so by understanding them, first, you're able to bridge the gap uh, between the dialogue that you're trying to put forth, between the product or services that you're trying to present and, and really hitting on those. So that's how the basic, the six basic needs would tie into those fundamentally two, two principles that I just spoke about. And we can go on um, through uh, the next set of, you know, four or five of them, if you like. I think this is a really good um, place to really dig in, right? Because um, the, the two things you said here are intertwined, right? Understanding your audience you need to establish an identity to know who you're... It's kind of like a cycle, right? Like you want to establish your identity so that you're attracting the right people and it's the people that you understand. Um, to give a concrete example of this, right? Uh, um, you know, Dickie Bush came on this show. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. It's uh, Ship 30 for 30. Uh, obviously doing great things and really like killing it in business. Um He's a little too hustle, hustle culture-y for me, right? And he, you know, he, he does he he and the people in that culture say things like, "You got to wake up at five a.m. and work for two straight hours." I've got three kids. If I wake up at five a.m., I will be lucky to get a half hour, right? Like um, to myself to do whatever. It's I'm, but I'm not his audience, right? This is the identity that his he has as a. I think he's in his mid twenties. I'm in my late 30s. I have a family. And so my identity closely aligns with that. And the people I'm going to attract, I'm going to say, hey, like running a business with kids is really hard and you're killing it. And if you want to kill it a little bit more, I can help you automate and save time because that's how I manage to run a business with three small children at home. Right. Yeah, I, I, I can totally relate um, actually to both, right? When you're in your 20s, um, you have more time for yourself. You have the mm-hmm. ability to be selfish. Your your responsibilities, most typically now, and this isn't for everybody, um, it, your responsibility is really to um, you know foster, care, nourish the progression of yourself as an individual and as a, a professional. So you, you're not necessarily holding the weight of a family um, and or other responsibilities. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer that you know, be firm in, in, in your vision, you know, in the identity, essentially the, the, the destination, um, who do you want to become, you know, at the end of all this journey and, or, or who are you striving to become or what are you striving to build? Be rigid in that vision, but be flexible in the approach, right? It's, it's, it's not a blueprint. It's not, there, there's no blueprint or cookie cutter approach um, to success. I know guys who don't turn on till midnight. You know, I was one mm-hmm. of them actually for a very long time. I didn't start working till midnight because in the, in the daytime, I was maintain. I was in maintenance mode, you know. And by by the evening, when everything settled down and I can have more time to myself, that's when I was able to push my businesses forward. And so there, there definitely is no um, a cookie cutter approach. And I, I, I would, I would caution, you know, uh, young entrepreneurs from being overly rigid. But, but I do see the benefit of, of discipline, right? Not to take away from anything in the discipline that you are going to have to carve out time mm-hmm. as an entrepreneur. Um, or as a as a you know sole business owner um, or as an artist, you're going to have to carve out time to master your craft and to push your business forward. Um, sometimes you know for folks that's five in the morning, and again sometimes that that could be midnight. As long as you're getting it done, I think uh, whatever is most conducive to you will, will work. I really like the be rigid in the vision, but flexible in the approach. Because again, you know you see, um, you know if you go on Twitter or LinkedIn, right, you see a 
do you want to be successful? Here's what you got to do, right? Here's, and what they're really saying is, here's what worked for me, right? But absolutely, people are tapping into this need for significance, right? Oh, well, Dickie Bush and Justin Welch, they've done significant things. Um, I want to be like them. And then the need for certainty. Oh, this thing worked for them. And so it's definitely going to work for me as well. Um, and as you was, uh, I'm going to say, right, I'm going to guess here, as long as, as you're establishing your identity, you need to determine what your approach is going to be like to inspire and connect with your audience because you you do need to do the, you do need to do that in a certain way to um oh what's the word I'm looking for here inspire significance inspire certainty make them feel like you can give them that does that make sense uh, absolutely yeah you certainly want to be able to relate um, to the folks that you're uh, speaking to you know and I and I take this um audience centered or human centric approach uh as, as as the primary driver for everything i do you know and i and i tell uh my directors um oftentimes is you you want to you you can give the most profound lecture you know in english to an audience that speaks mandarin and you can pride yourself on the quality of uh substance and the value that you've been able to add but if you're if your audience only speaks Mandarin and you're speaking English, they're not going to understand it. It's, it's, it's as good as falling on deaf ears there. Mm-hmm. And so you really want to know who you're speaking to and how to best um, relate to them and how to send a message that will closely resonate um, and, and, and make an impact there. And so that's just kind of the classic example that I use. I love that. Bef- before I became an actual good teacher and, uh, you know, you can go and rate my professor to see the good scores. So I'm not just uh, making that up. But before that I was teaching my mom how to use a computer. And um, I said, you know, like, oh, just right click on that icon. And so she like moved the the whole cursor across the screen and clicked and uh, nothing happened. And I'm like, you got to right click. And I'm just yelling the word right click at her. And she's like, I moved to the right and I clicked. And I'm like, that's not what that means. Just right click. And I'm like, oh, there's the second button there. Press the other button. Um and so I really resonate with uh, if you're if you're speaking Mandarin, right? Or if, if your audience only speaks Mandarin. If my mom didn't speak computer, I knew right. what right click <laughs> meant, right? Um, that's that's really interesting. I think that's really cool. Um, so when you said establish identity, I thought of a few. Um, I thought of a few people, right? And these people are some of them are going to be polarizing, right? But like one is. Tucker Carlson, right? This guy has an identity. Maybe he's like that in real life. Uh, uh, Maybe. But the point is, he has this persona and he has inspired millions of people to basically just take whatever he says at face value. I would say that's on the extreme end of things, right? But if you... I guess how seriously should you... How seriously should you take this identity? How far should should you take it? Um, do you always need to be on? I guess is another way to put it. If you're trying to build and connect with an audience, yeah, I think you know what, what it really depends on what you're in it for. You know, um, what is the identity really built on? Is it on mm-hmm. you know adding value? Is it on some folks you know love to build an identity on non segregating people and. And being extremely polar, like you said, you know, taking mm-hmm. a one-sided approach and, and defending that um, to the death, and they build an audience. I, I think the more relatable you are, if we just talk about general marketing, right? Uh, yeah. It, the more relatable you are, uh, the wider audience you have the potential um, to capture. Now, that doesn't mean that you should go after everybody, so to speak. You can pick a particular segment um, and and try to relate and, and resonate with them. Um, I'm not a big fan on 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 taking a polar stance uh, generally speaking you know uh, I think objectivity particularly in business um, is is very very important um, I think you know you, th- you you can learn a lot um, from folks that have you know uh, that take an opposite stance from you right everybody has levels of logic um, at a certain position that that, that justifies uh, you know their perspective, um, so to speak. So, yeah, I, I, I take polar stances potentially on on certain particular topics, right? But in the overall business 
uh, domain, um, I, I, I tend to gravitate away from that. Uh, you, you, you don't know uh, what you don't know, essentially, right? We can all speak from experiences here. We can all speak, you know, textbook. Um, should we need to refer back to something? But uh, you, you really have to go through the motions of particulars to be able to speak on them. And, and I, I tend to be as objective as possible in my dialogue, in my analysis, and in, in, in my approach. I like that. Because, again, I think you need to, you know, I've been told by um, people who are writing, you know, I I use maybe too many hedging words. I just use one right there, right? Maybe. Um, I'll say kind of or usually or likely. Um, and I've been told that if I use too many or any of those words that I'm softening my position. Um, I'm really trying to take a, a, a more balanced approach. But like you said, I think taking the polarizing topic or the polarizing apo- approach sometimes, or maybe just taking a strong stand, a stronger stand sometimes helps you stand out, but keeping an open mind is what helps you become a better business owner. Uh, absolutely. That's spot on. Every, everybody wants to speak to somebody, especially a leader um, or an authority on a topic that has a degree of confidence, right? When you're questioning mm-hmm. yourself with the maybes and, you know, the, the what ifs, um, uh, so to speak, and the, these kind of words, there is uh, kings in the armor, you know, and mm-hmm. and uh, everybody's looking for that certainty, especially if you're the authority figure, right? That's a good way to go back to a, a psychological need um, for humans is they're asking you a question or they're going to you um, to get answers on a particular topic. And, you know, it's like going to visit a doctor and he's looking at an x-ray and, you know, he's looking at me. That could be something fatal. I, I'm not sure, uh, you know, well, what am I here for? Um, right. If you're not the person to tell me or the one to find out and further investigate. If you're not sure, I'm certainly not sure, right? Um, and, and and as I mentioned earlier, you're going to want to take polar stances on particular topics. You're going to be just that passionate about it. But that also just, you, you, it all goes back to what are you in it for and what is the audience that you've identified that you want to impact? Uh, because in, in retrospect, it may bring an audience closer and it may deviate an audience further. So that comes back to your identity. Um, who do you want to be? What kind of impact do, do you want to make? Who do you want to resonate with? And, and not to say that you can speak to generalities either and be a jack of all trades. I I shy away from that also, right? A friend a friend to many is a friend to no one, as the old saying goes, <laughs> right? So yeah. I like that. That's... Um... Feels like a, a politician is probably a friend to many, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, again, I, I think this is great. Connecting with your audience is, uh, Wes K.O. calls it sp- a spiky point of view, right? Share your spiky point of view um, because that will resonate w- more with people than just saying, well, you know, I guess if you want to record your podcast with Zoom, that's okay, right? Versus like never record your podcast with Zoom unless you want it to sound like crap. Like, I guess if you want to sound like crap, Record with Zoom, right? Like that's right. one of my spiky points of view. Um, I want to pivot here because along with connecting with people in your audience, um, these basic needs and, and main drivers can also assist you in negotiating, right? And I know that a lot of my own clients and students come to me and they're like, how do I, how do I get a sponsor? How do I know if I'm charging enough? Um, you know, they offered me a free product. Is that good enough? It's not. Um, Unless you can like pay your rent with whatever free product they give you, it's not enough, right? Um, So how can we, how can we leverage some of these principles when it comes to negotiation? So talking specifically about um, the the industry that you're in and and looking for uh, sponsored content, um, potentially bringing sponsors to the table um, who may have some sort of offering um, for you to attract more visibility to their audience. Uh, I, I, we can take a deep dive as to how to best negotiate uh, potentially with them or an angle or an approach um, that, that that one may take to have better legs um, to stand on. And I know that you've interviewed Justin Moore before, and uh, he really dived into this particular topic and touched base on uh, three points. I think that would be an immense value to uh, your users. Yeah, for sure. I'll link that episode in the show notes. You can find everything at howibuilt.it slash 320. But uh, yeah, he says, you know, it's either you're either looking for views, uh, a brand is either looking for views um, or direct sales, right? So like that's direct ROI. Uh, They're looking for brand awareness. So it doesn't really matter how many people are viewing, but they want other people talking about them or content repurposing, right? Which 
you can have no views and no downloads. They just want you to create the content so that they don't have to hire somebody to create the content. Uh, that that is spot on. Let's let, we can even take a deep dive into the, the psychology a bit behind that. And if if you really see what what a, a brand is is looking for, right? They want more eyeballs um, on them, more ears, um, so to speak, more clicks to their website, and so they're really looking for that attention. Now, unfortunately, for solo um, entrepreneurs or artists just getting started, you know, when a brand is coming to really judge you on a direct sales they want to see an established audience there's no question so you go into the game already knowing that i'm going to put as much content as i can out there if i don't have eyeballs already on me if i haven't been you know related to a significant endeavor before that's put me on the map and i'm going to make the sacrifices it is a and not a journey for the faint of heart uh, nevertheless so if you're going in it to uh, jump into your first you know few dozen um podcast episodes um, and you don't have the audience, it's going to be very hard to get a deal by a company that's looking for direct sales, right? The views uh, for them and an audience and an established audience, so to speak. Now, speaking to that point is understanding why the other person is on the other end of the table here. What is the purpose for them being here? Right? You're getting an offering for something or you're picturing an offering. What is it that they want? What are they looking for? Is it the direct sales? Is it the brand awareness? Um, is it the content repurposing um, that, uh, that, that Justin alluded, alluded to? Now, understanding this is very much like understanding your audience, right? We spoke about this already in the realm of business, understanding your employees, understanding your clients. This is another uh, entity at the table that has a purpose for being there. So understanding their why, taking it back to the fundamentals. Why would they want to work with me? What are they looking for? Um, and you know, how can I uh, fulfill that? So if, if they're there for direct sales, you can rest assured that, that you probably have a, an audience that is widespread or engagement. You know, sometimes they look for an engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, you may not have to have the biggest audience, you know, and I know this from the uh, fitness realm uh, where you can see fitness influencers, you know, have millions and then you see deals get pitched to those who have maybe in the hundreds of thousands or the tens of thousands because the engagement is there. The demographic that they're really targeting um, is there. That's been honed in on. Um, so understanding why they're at the table to begin with uh, negotiating with you is going to be really important. Um, and building rapport and how building rapport is essentially selling your story, right? Um, the negotiations is very much a sale. You're, you're really trying to sell um, your value. You're trying to sell your position um, and trying to extract you know, uh, something in return. So where it can't be quantified numerically, like when we talk about uh, the amount of engagement you have or the wide audience that, 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 that you may have already with you, you want to be able to add the value somewhere, you know, and the closer that you can get to this value add that is most relatable to the motivation of the entity or the person on the other end, uh, the more you're going to be able to see um, success in your um in, in your negotiations. So building rapport, you know, really selling your story, you know, at the end of the day, people really resonate um, with other people we've mentioned and people really resonate with stories, um, showing the value that you're going to bring forth. If it's brand awareness um, or even content repurposing, showcasing that creativity, um, what makes you unique and, and what makes you stand alone from everybody else? Because you can guarantee, you know, and the bigger the deals get, um, the more people go knocking on their doors trying to pitch them all sorts of things. So back to your identity, you know, what is, who, who is it that you are, right? And and what are the problems that you're trying to solve and what are you trying to bring forth and how much value does that add for them? And like all sales and like all negotiation, right? Everybody um, tries to pitch from their perspective, but on the opposite end, you know, you, you have somebody essentially most of the time thinking what's in it for me, what's mm -hmm. in it for me. Right. And so instead of imposing your position is understanding what the position um, is on the opposing end and trying to get closer to that. It's, it's very much the principles uh, of a sale. Um, knowing what you're willing to bend on, what you're willing to stand firm on and really having a reality check. Where am I in this game right now? Right. Am I, do, do I have the ability um, to make these demands? Do I have the position to be able to make these demands? And and uh, taking taking that approach, just understanding the context um, of, of of the transaction or the negotiations that you're in. Yeah, I think that that makes so much sense. Um, 
and uh, under you know, my pitches got a lot better when I went from, oh, I can talk about you here and I can talk about you there and I love your product to, hey, if you like if you want to reach the kind of people I'm talking to, if you want me to create great content, great video content for you that you can embed on your website um, to show people how small business owners like me use your product, like this is why you should go with me, right? Um, and I think it, it really goes back to uh, if if we kind of look at these six principles, right? Um, contribution. H- how do you teach people? Uh, we all have something we're good at, right? Um, so I just want to relay a story from a recent sponsor. It took a long time to negotiate because they had some terms that I didn't really want to agree to. Um, so like you said, like I wanted to stand firm on some things. I was able to bend on a couple of other things. And then it was really important to them that I actually tried their product and used it and told a personal story around me using the product. And it's probably one of the best ad reads I've ever done, right? If you've listened to those episodes that were sponsored, I talk about how like I hate running, but I've been waking up to run um, because it's the only time that I can do it, right? With the hectic day um, and how their product helped me recover. Uh, after doing an early morning run so that my the whole rest of my day wasn't just me like lying in bed because I was so tired or whatever. Um, I'm probably not running right if it like ruins my whole day, but that's that's a conversation for another time. Um, I really feel like that's one of the best ad reads I've ever done because it was it was legit. Like they wanted me to use their product and they they gave me talking points. But they were like, talk about it from your own, make it conversational. Um, and I think stuff like that is so important, especially because people on this show trust me. They've been listening to me for like six or seven years at this point. Um, and and a true endorsement is something that they wouldn't be able to get from Joe Rogan, probably, right? Joe Rogan's not trying every... Joe, Joe Rogan's not selling his own ads. He's not trying every product that comes across his desk. He wants to read a script. I know that. And so I can sell, hey, I'll actually use your product. Absolutely. And particularly, you know, uh, companies these days, they, they they really look for folks that are relatable, right? Otherwise, everybody would pay for a celebrity endorsement, you know, if right. that worked 100% of the time. Right? Yeah. Um, so they, they, they want the product to both be uh, personable um, and, and, and because of such, be, be relatable. And everybody, you know, goes to uh, the pitch immediately. And we, we spoke about that. And, the, you know, Alex Hermosi, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar yeah. with him these days. He's yeah, profound, profound uh, business owner and, and, and marketer. And he really talks about the pain is the pitch, right? The transactional element at the end of it, uh, at the end of, of dialogue, particularly in sales, um, that's that's very short. You know, it's, it's, hey, are you, you know, essentially breaking down the price and you're ready to pay for this? Um, but but you have a relatable dialogue, understanding the pain, unveiling those pain points. And it could be for a company too, right? You, you, you spoke about uh, my audience is small business owners, right? And now what does that mean to them? Are you guys relatable to it? And the more information that you would have on, on the opposite party here in the negotiations is I noticed that you only cast, for example, you know, 3% of your audience is that. However, uh, you know, small businesses still employ the most uh, individuals in the United States um, to date. And so are you really missing out on a relatable audience here that I can connect to, et cetera? And so ha- having uh, un- understanding um, that relatability is, is is key and presenting yourself as incredibly relatable and being able to tell a story, particularly in today's day and age, um, will really, really give you the edge. Yeah. And um, in off- Inauthenticity, I think that's a word, right? Being inauthentic is so obvious. Like, I don't know, have you seen Instagram ads or Facebook ads where it's very clear, it's like a celebrity endorsement, but it's very clearly a cameo, right? Right. Like you went to cameo.com and you paid a celebrity 50 bucks or whatever to read this. Um, That is just like, I will never use a product where someone uses that tactic, right? Like it's so, so very obviously fake. And it like right. kills me. Yeah, it just it's it's too robotic, it's too generic. And yeah, people people are a lot smarter these days. And and particularly because everybody's knocking on the door trying to sell some something, right? Mm-hmm. Um 
the more authentic that we feel it is, the more social proof, essentially, the organic social proof, essentially, that it has, um, it, it allows us to trust the brand more. And and, and brand trustability, um, it, it's, it's realistically everything. That's, that's the uh, part to business that you can't put a price on, right? Yeah. That's what makes the business, that's what gives the business its goal. Yeah, absolutely. And I know we're coming up on time here, but for members in the pro show, uh, I'd love to talk about building that trust through oversharing. Julian, I'd love to get your take on just kind of giving away information for free in the pro show, which you can sign up for uh, over at howibuilt.it slash pro, uh, starting at five bucks a month or 50 bucks a year. Um, but for now, uh, I'd, I'd love to wrap up with a couple of pieces of actionable advice. So let's say someone listening to this, maybe they have a podcast, maybe they have an established YouTube channel, but they want to take it to the next level. Um, what would you recommend the first couple of steps they take are? First few action items, and I love this, by the way, I don't think anybody should walk away from, from anything without having some uh, action items that can make an impact for them moving forward is, you know, again, understand uh, who you are and what impact you want to make. Um, adopt that human-centric approach. Now that you want to make that impact, what audience are you really catering to? Where do these audience, where does this audience hang out? How could you learn this audience, you know, essentially better than they know themselves? Um, and, and, and understanding their pain points and, and their, their goals, um, both the opportunities there and, and, and the liabilities that they face. And then getting a reality check, right? It's really important. You got to understand where you really are um, at this state of the game and where is it that you want to be? And seeing what the deficits might be there, you know, uh, as Tony Robbins says, developing a map from where you stand um, to where you want to go and map uh, can be an acronym for a massive action plan, right? What are the things that are, are going to drive the buck forward and get you closer um, to that destination? Now, do, and, and never let, um, you know, uh, progress uh, or, or perfection impede progress, right? Never let perfection impede progress. You, doing something and, and learning um, from, from, from that dealing is better than you taking a, a standstill and being in your head and never really getting started um, or, or feeling stuck. And thereafter, measure um, everything that you can, right? It's easier to manage things when you can measure them. Am I doing the right thing? What were the consequences, good or bad, from from what I'm doing right now? And let me do more of the stuff that works. Um, so being able to measure where you can, setting realistic goals and, and, and milestones um, for yourself. And being adaptable and resilient. I, I can't stress this. This is probably the most important take I can give to anybody um, starting a business um, or getting into the, the, the world of entrepreneurship. You have to learn how to be resilient um, and, and adapt. Again, be rigid in your, desti uh, in your destination, but be flexible in your approach and anticipate that you're going to fail. Okay, That's the most important thing is this is a lifelong journey in entrepreneurship. There's always a next level. Um, there's always something new that you would you, you go and have to learn and, and, and take that time in your journey to skill stack. Just keep acquiring the skills that in time will exponentially move you forward. Uh, what is it that I'm missing that makes me more effective, more of value, more unique, uh, creates a bigger story around me? Learn how to focus on, on those things, those skills that you need to acquire to really drive the buck forward um, faster. Lots of great advice there. Uh, I will list these out as well in the show notes. I was writing them down. Uh, understand who you are. Where does your audience hang out? Get a reality check. Never let perfection impede progress. Measure everything you can. Be adaptable and resilient. Um, it's funny that you mentioned perfection because maybe the maybe some keen-eared people will have heard that I've, I, I shuffle poker chips at my desk, right? Uh, it takes six perfect shuffles to get the stack of poker chips back to its original order, right? So if you have red and green chips, uh, put them in separate stacks, shuffle them six times, and they will be back to organized as red and green. I shuffle poker chips every day. It's just like, that's my fidget. I, uh, I will get the perfect shuffle a few times in a day, but my percentage is probably low. One sticks, one uh, falls maybe, I mess it up a little bit. Um, but I don't let that stop me from shuffling poker chips. So I think never let perfection impede progress. 
is um, uh, applicable and fun in poker chips, even more important in business because perfection is rare. And if you only waited for perfection, you would never do anything. So spot on. Uh, entrepreneurship is, is it's a journey um, and the destination are really, they're, they're milestones or goalposts for you. And it is the progression um, that, that you're looking for. Um, and it's never going to be perfect. You're always going to have a, a problem and you just hope for better quality problems in entrepreneurship, right? Uh, but yeah, understanding that uh, it's, it's, it's never going to be perfect and you're going to just have to keep it trucking forward. And the better that you are, at acquiring skills and becoming more adaptable and, and taking failures as opportunities um, to get better and better, you put yourself in a more probable position to succeed. You know, you shuffle poker chips on the daily. Now, the probability of you getting it right is monumentally greater than, than, than me taking a, a shot at it right now from, 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 from my experience and, and where I stand at it. And that's what we're hoping to become, just better versions of ourselves um, day in and day out. That's a great point to end on. Julian, this has been fantastic. If people want to learn more about you, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on uh, LinkedIn, uh, most particular. Um, I don't have a whole lot of content um, out there right now, but uh, plenty to come. Awesome. I will link to that and everything we talked about in the show notes over at howibuilt.it slash 320. If you're a member, be sure to stick around because uh, we're going to be talking about some fun stuff about building trust by oversharing in the pro show. If you're not a member, you can sign up over at how I built it slash pro. But Julian, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And thank you for listening. Thanks to our sponsors. And until next time, get out there and build something. <laughs>